All right. Thank you. So, uh, welcome. We are going to be talking about edutopia.org, uh, which is a website that I was the project manager for, uh, working with uh, a team of Lullabots and the team at the George Lucas Educational Foundation to build a Drupal 8 plus React app for it. Um, my name is Darren Peterson. I am a saxophonist by training and a, a dev and uh, you know, systems architect and, and project manager now at Lullabot. Um, Lullabot is a company that's based everywhere because we have people in uh, Europe and North America. We have about 50 of us. We're all um, working from our homes, totally distributed. And we've been in the Drupal business for 12 years or so, so one of the earliest Drupal agencies. I've been with Lullaby about five years. Um, before that, I was a, a freelancer, and then I was in higher ed before that. So um, so Lullaby is great. We do all kinds of, of clients, uh, especially uh, we have sort of a name for the media clients. So we've worked a lot with NBC and other television channels, sci-fi.com, uh, MSNBC, stuff like that. Um, but also higher ed and, and finance, and uh, lately a little more government than we used to. So, um, so my question for you is: I sort of want to pitch what I'm about to say to the room and make sure that I, I answer your questions and, and don't leave you just like, "Wow, that guy talked a lot, but didn't actually tell me what I wanted to know." So I'm interested. Who here is like actually a, a practitioner, developer, like in in the, the trenches doing stuff right now? Yes. How many folks are like not technical? They're totally on the business side. Excellent. Good, good. I have something for you too, I promise. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any of you are totally brand new to JavaScript frameworks? It, it's okay if you are. Brave soul back there says, I'm not a JavaScript guy. So I'm not going to be able to answer deep questions on most of this stuff. But I was involved in lots of the architecture and lots of the way that we planned this, and so I'll be able to give you a pretty good direction that you can hunt down. Um, and have you actually built a couple of projects? A couple of you? Excellent. And um, so, is, is there any, like, anybody with a burning question that they want to be sure they get answered today? Like, if they go home without it, they're just going to be crushed. Anybody? That's, that's all of it. <laughs> all of these things. We were talking about performance. I've got some of that. Um, so things that we're about to discuss, reasons to take on a decoupled project or not, because there's definite reasons not to. Um, anybody considering a project in, in the near future and trying to figure out what to do? Yeah, a couple of you, all right. So structured data and why it matters, because if you don't have the right data in Drupal, then it doesn't matter how your API interacts with your front end, you're going to have a lot of problems. Um, just a general overview of how our particular implementation worked. We'll, we got some, some steps to go through on that. Uh, different ways that editors are using uh, the CMS and how that ends up working out on the front end. We want to talk about that a little bit. And then performance. Because if you haven't visited edutopia.org, it's probably the fastest site I've ever been involved with. <laughs> it's ridiculously fast. And I hope that when you try it out, it turns out to be the same for you. But it really was for me. Uh, that, that was uh, when I went to DrupalCon, a buddy of mine, I used to live in Portland, now I live in Denton, up north of Dallas. Um, I saw him at the Lullabot party, and I said, hey, I just came off of edutopia.org. You should check it out. And he about fell off his chair. And he's a guy that really knows his stuff in terms of JavaScript and way better than me. So I was. I was pleased that he was thrilled by it. Um, if we have enough time, I also want to talk about the problem of previewing and an editorial preview within the context of a, of a decoupled site, because this is a hard problem that uh, doesn't have a lot of ready solutions out of the box. Anybody actually had to fight with that yet? Mm -hmm. All right, so I could, I'll try and prioritize that, make sure we get there. So the big question in all this is to decouple or not to decouple, yes? Another way to phrase that is, why build one website when two could do the same job? <laughs> and that's the burning question. That's the burning question. <laughs> Everybody wants to know why. Why? Why isn't two better than one? Um, maybe that's not quite right. Reverse that. So, the the basic question is at our in our practice a little bit when we talk to a client many times now, the the word about decoupling has reached them, and so we have to ask. But why? What is it that you need so badly that you have to build two websites, effectively, two different stacks, two different 
skill sets with the dev team, all those things are um, hard to acquire. You have to have the right people or retrain your people, all those things. So you also have to end up reinventing the wheel a lot. Things that you get for free with Drupal, like logging, error handling, authentication, all of that stuff is great in Drupal and so great that you don't even have to think about it. You just go and check out the watchdog log or you look at the error log and you see what's going wrong in your site. When you have an incident with a um, with the React app, you also have to have had logging on the React side to somewhere, and that somewhere is not defined when you start your project. Error handling, not defined. You have to write that yourself. And then you have to sync up the logs here and the logs there to find out what's actually the culprit. Is it a performance problem in the back end? Is it a, a traffic problem in the front end? What's going on? So there's lots of reinventing the wheel that we all joined Drupal so that we wouldn't have to do. Like I never want to write a password change algorithm ever again, right? That's That was my reason to start Drupal 10 years ago. I was sick of uh, writing authentication. So you know, you know you're going to spend at least twice the effort to build this thing. So what's the upside? So as you may know, if you've got multiple channels where you want to put your content out to, you have to have an API and therefore uh, decoupled site makes good sense. The first people that were doing this was probably, uh, at least to, to my experience, was NPR back in the day. And they had APIs so that they could serve out bits of content to, to affiliate radio stations all across the country, and they had done a really good job of being really bleeding edge pioneers of that stuff. And since then, we've talked a lot about that, about how you model content. So if, if you're familiar with all about Jeff Eaton, who's one of our content strategists, and he has been arguing for years and years about the body field. You'll see some of those kinds of things in the presentation this morning that you, you have to do it a certain way, otherwise the API is going to be no good to you. Um, beyond that, over time you can like change out the front end and the back end and the editorial experience and all that content modeling you did doesn't actually have to move. You can put a different face on it and it would only be whatever the spend is, whatever the effort is to, to do that. And then last but not least, Performance was a killer app for Edutopia, both for audience engagement reasons, that they didn't want to lose the traffic that they were uh, acquiring, and also because, you know, back and forth, they were, I, the, the actual problem at Edutopia is Facebook <laughs> is where their teachers are. And I'll tell you a little bit about Edutopia in, in just a second, but they, their audience is on Facebook, they're posting content on Facebook. If they do get them back from Facebook, they really have to hold them. So you don't want to have a slow website. Um, additionally, on top of that, more and more fast is uh, an SEO consideration because Google is thinking about that in the, in the course of its uh, indexing. So we've got a world where a fast website is going to be like table stakes in the future. So if you're not doing decoupled because it's too much work and all that kind of stuff, we may all find ourselves in the place where we need to do it because all the competition is getting better search engine results and everything else because of uh, the performance improvements that it can offer. So, all this is to say, yes? So, have you benchmarked, I mean, I know that's a very hard question, sure. that's a problem. but have you actually benchmarked that same thing in a standard Drupal with Varnish and a CDN in front of it and a decoupled app with, you know, um, or has anyone looked at that? Benchmarked the actual performance? Yeah, of it? I mean, that's what you're saying, the performance is not. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about performance in the, in the course okay. of time. It is definitely faster. It's definitely faster. <laughs> definitely <laughs> faster. <laughs> like we're talking, and as you told me, we're talking about sub-second page loads once you're on the site. That first initial load is on desktop maybe two and a half seconds or three. Yeah. Yep. And then when you click on that first article, it's like less than a second and you're, you're reading it. So you can't get that with full page loads on, on a, a regular desktop site going back to the server all the time because you're loading all those assets every time and there's specific optimizations you can do with a JavaScript app that just make it so you only load the right thing and then render it and you're done. So that is a great win um, and it keeps people engaged if you can get them onto your website in the first place. But you know Facebook is, is causing a problem <laughs> for that and Google and you know all that stuff. Um, but to tell you about Edutopia, Edutopia is originally a magazine and then a website funded by the George Lucas Educational Foundation. Star Wars fans, mm -hmm. raise your hands, yes? I got to go to Skywalker Ranch for the client on site. Oh. <laughs> I thought I was going to, um, <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to, to keep my cool, and it was going to be fine. And you drive onto the property in Marin County, and you get out there, and you have lunch at the cafeteria, and then uh, Eric, our our main stakeholder, will be sort of walked us through the ranch house, which is where all the main stuff goes. And this is 
this is the screening room where they screened the prequels and the door's this thick so it's soundproof. And, and you walk through this little sort of glassed in thing and that's Luke Skywalker's lightsaber from Return of the Jedi, actual movie prop. You can see how it was like soldered together and junk. It isn't the replica, it's the real deal. That one, that was a replica of Darth Vader's, but that's the real one. You know, Sankara stones and, and Indy's hat and I uh, lost it. So in any case, it was great to be on Skywalker. Um, so Hypertopia, their mission statement you know, is basically to take research and best practices and write them up and, and case studies of schools that are succeeding and doing innovative things in education and put them out there so teachers that are teaching in the classroom in, in the K-12 can get access to the best uh, resources and the, and, the, and the newest ideas about how to improve education. And so George began to fund that over the course of time uh, and, the, and the website has become its primary way of doing that. So they called us up because they had a Drupal 7 site which had content which had been migrated from 10 or 15 years of content, you know, all the way going back to Drupal 6 and before, and they wanted to move to Drupal 8. So they called us up and said, hey, let's do a discovery and talk about how we should do that. So Sally, who is one of our Lullabots, um, she goes by Justafish on Drupal.org. She is the leader of the JavaScript Modernization Initiative, um, which, if you haven't heard of that, is the is that that thing that was on the, what, the five dots, what was it, 5.7? Uh, they're going to have, hopefully, uh, you know, a year from now, we'll be looking at a JavaScript decoupled editorial experience running against Drupal. Um, and so she's been working with, with uh, people to, to get all that together. So she's brilliant and has been working with APIs and, and API first kinds of stuff for a long time. She was part of the discovery team. She went out there and talked with them and asked them all the questions about why decoupled and which bleeding edge technology would you like? And we have sort of had a list of things that we heard they wanted and we crossed a bunch of stuff off the list and said, what we really think is you need this instead. So, all right. So, what we ended up with was a fairly simple stack that didn't have a lot of extraneous stuff. Um, you know, the Express web server sitting on top of Node, uh, React and Redux to, to manage the, the front end piece of it, and then Drupal and JSON API on the back end. So we tried to keep the amount of new technology to a minimum because there's a huge risk every time you add a new piece of technology that nobody's touched and really worked with. We had worked with React and Angular and things like that in the past, but we wanted to be sure that uh, the site that we passed off to them was not going to be a huge burden to like retool all their developer skills because their team was, was not um, really sizable. And so we needed to, to keep it under control. So JSON API is, is worthy of a, of a mention. Anybody actually use the JSON API module yet? A couple of us? All right. So this handsome fellow is Mateo, Mateo Bosch, who lives in Mallorca in Spain, also a lullabot. Um, he is another of the big brains around API first stuff in Drupal. He has uh, taken the JSON API uh, spec, which is not a Drupal thing, it's, a, it's an internet thing. It basically the idea is that after 10 years or so of doing REST services, everybody is sick of not knowing what's in the API. Right, like, oh, you have an API when you start working with somebody. What's it made of? I don't know. What's the documentation? I don't know. We just have some stuff on a server. So JSON API specifies how to access resources via an API, and it specifies how those resources are going to return to you and what data structure it's going to be in. And it's particular about that. But that way, nobody has to argue about what's in the API. They just know, oh, it's a JSON API uh, implementation, so it has a particular set of standards it conforms to. So he's been doing that as well as uh, the Contenta CMS project that was referenced in, during the keynote this morning, uh, which gives you JSON API and GraphQL and a bunch of other stuff in a Drupal box with a whole bunch of JavaScript front ends to be able to, to give you samples of how that uh, works. So you could take Contenta today, install it, have an API first Drupal distribution and start to build on that with a, with a JavaScript front end of your choice. So Contenta is worth checking out. It's, it's pretty slick. So, JSON API is a contributed module for Drupal that implements the JSON API standard. And what it does is it takes any entity in Drupal and renders it as JSON data. So anything that you can slap a field on, so that's nodes, users, taxonomy terms, custom entities, uh, you have access to them via the API. So this would be an example. JSON API slash node slash article, and then whatever the identifier is for that particular article, going to be a long alphanumeric string, um, would deliver to you that article in the JSON API format. If you wanted to access another 
thing, like taxonomy terms or users, you would specify the entity and the type, like term slash vocabulary machine name, if that makes sense to you guys. And again, UUID. You can also take the UUID off and you get 50 of those things in you know, whatever the, uh, and then it would, you could ask for se sequential pages of that. The other thing is you can filter it by field. So you can specify, and you'll see this in another example soon, um, you can specify a field name within Drupal and a value for that field name, and then it'll give you just that content that, that filters and matches those criteria. And then you can also do anything that's an entity reference can also be included as a part of the API. So you can have related content, you can have anything that um, you want to, to reach out and, and touch from your content model. So the trick though is, now that we've got a magical contrib module that you turn on, you've still got to be able to have decent data to, to pump out of it. Oh, I forgot to say, JSON API respects your permissions in Drupal. So if you have a uh, certain content that should only be available to authenticated users, you can set that up and JSON API will fail the, the API re response, give you a 403, say access denied to that. The, um, and then it also understands uh, authentication scheme through the Drupal. So you can tell it, I am actually authenticated, and then it gives you the access to the resource. So what makes a good API? The basic idea is you need structured content. You need something that is, you know, actually broken up into pieces so that your templates in React can do something like drop in a, a variable like the title and stick it into your markup. Um, so unstructured content, this is the battle for the body field stuff. Um, unstructured content is bad. Basically, if you, if you type a bunch of stuff into CK Editor and say go, and then try to stuff that into an API, the API is going to render it to you, but it's going to render it to you as markup. And then when you get to React, React's going to say, great, markup. And React is going to, you're going to hear the sigh from the front end. It's going to actually make a noise. Um, no, that's the developer. No, that's the developer. I'm sorry, what was I thinking? I got so used to hearing the sigh. Um, the basic idea being, you know, React can't pull that out. There's no identifier that says this is the, this is the summary that you would like show on the screen. And so instead of being able to do anything with it, you would have to call a function in React, which is called dangerously set inner HTML. <laughs> That's the name of the function, right? And so dangerously set inner HTML is what you have to do in order to, to take a bunch of markup and just put it out to the screen as is. You don't know where it came from, you don't have to save. So by contrast, JSON API gives you that same information, but it sticks it in a JSON object. What that means is anything you want JSON API to touch has to be in a field in Drupal. Everybody say fields. 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 Oh, yeah. Fields. Fields warm and fuzzy. Best practice. Here. All right. So structured content is what you want. You have to do a content model that allows you to put stuff into fields. This may make your editors crazy. We'll talk more about that. So we, did, we made the, the recommendations. We talked about the technology stack. And Edutopia said, yep, yeah, let's do this. So they brought myself and Matt Robinson, who was our back-end developer, and John Hanna, and another uh, person who was at Lullaby at the time, and Carwin Young, who was amazing as well, uh, not pictured here. But these two guys and I were, were the, the core of the team that ended up building Edutopia. So we had a lot of things to work out. Um, and for the most part, uh, I think we did a good job. So let's talk about it. If you haven't played with a decoupled app or you don't know how the, the request flow works, uh, the web server on the Node side, on Node.js side, gets a request. And that request could be for an article. And so when it requests that article, it has to decide what to do with it. This is your first hard problem. The front end needs to know uh, what to do with that request that's been given. This is called routing. It needs to know how to route that request to Drupal. And so we have Basically, you know, you could do it a lot of ways. You could say the, the ID comes in over the wire, and you take that ID and you pass it. Or you could do what we did, which was we wanted human URLs for the most part. And so uh, this bit here, the URL alias typically in Drupal, we just said it's going to be the same on the front end. We're going to turn it into a slug that we're going to pass as a filter to our API request. Before I move on, does that make sense? Yes. Heads nodding all over the room? Excellent, okay. So basically, we just did the simplest thing we could possibly do. We passed the, what was going to be the URL alias from Drupal through. So that goes to Drupal. Drupal gets the API request at our JSON API endpoint, which is the article endpoint. That's how JSON API works. You have to say, I'm looking for articles, or I'm looking for taxonomy terms, or whatever. So it looks up the data. 
goes through a normalization process, which is where you can get in the mix and like add stuff to the API result or modify the data in some way, uh, which is a really important thing to play with that I don't talk about much more in this. But if you're working with JSON API and you want to do something to the data, there is a framework of normalizers that you can subclass and do stuff with. Important piece. <coughs> but it renders the JSON API response, which looks, as we've seen, a little bit like this. There's the title of our, of our node that we asked for. Um, Side note, meta tags, the meta tag module does not, at, at least as if I remember correctly, does not represent its information, like all that SEO stuff, all the, all the Facebook and Twitter card stuff, does not show up as actual fields on your, on your node. So we had to do a thing to make all this meta tag information show up into the API. That would be a great example of a normalizer. We had to write a meta tag normalizer that took the meta tag information and dropped it in here so it would be available to react, to play with, right? So you take all that data, you pass it back up, Express picks up the response to this request that it issued, and it says, okay, now I've got data. And it passes it off to Redux. Full disclosure, not a Redux expert. <laughs> Can't answer your questions, but I can tell you, Redux is a state management library. Redux takes data, and in our case, we took the JSON API data, which comes in a very specific format, and we put it in a bag and shook it up and poured it into into Redux differently than it came from JSON API because it wasn't as useful in JSON API as we wanted it to be. Um, JSON API, when you have related content, uh, puts it in in a, a place at the bottom of the response called uh, included. Included has all the, the related data. That's great, except you don't have it where you need it up here. You can't just like iterate over the API response and you've got it. You have to look it up by its UUID in two different places within the response. It's kind of a pain. So we did all that here to drop it into Redux. Having dropped it into Redux, we can save it to the state, and then Redux makes an announcement to the, to the JavaScript app and says, I have data that has changed. And this is kind of how the, the Redux React pairing works is Redux has all this data when it sees a change either initially because it just received the data or when a piece of data that it already knows about has changed. It fires off an event and says, we've got changes, everybody. React says, changes? I know what properties go into my components. I'm just going to re-render that one component that needs to be changed. And this is why it ends up being fast, is it looks at small changes in data and re-renders specific components onto the screen. So then you end up with data from React properties, props in this case, is the, the object that we're handling. Props.title has changed. Oh, I'm going to re-render the, the article header, which includes that, and it ends up rendering it out to the screen. And if Redux senses a change to props.title, it would change that and re-render the article header component again. So everything you see on the screen, like this piece and this piece and this piece, are all different components, quote unquote, in React. Components is one of those overloaded words. <laughs> like, you know, everything's a component, because we have components on the Drupal side for various reasons as well. Not the same thing at all. So we've got all this stuff, and that's great. We have uh, an architecture that we can use that's going to work. Everybody say, yeah. yeah. Now we have a problem. Legacy URLs. We have 10 to 15 years of URLs where editors have been going into Drupal and typing in a URL for a piece of content totally custom. Sometimes they're at the root of the, of the site. Sometimes an article is called a discussion, so discussion slash title. <laughs> Sometimes an article, I mean, th there was a million variations because it was a haystack, really more of a, um, a bramble, I think, because haystacks don't have thorns. Um, so we had all these legacy URLs which didn't have any pattern to them. Routing is impossible without a pattern. Right? So you think that you're going to get a request and that you're going to be able to bake some logic into the front end that says articles all start with slash article. Videos all start with slash video. We didn't have that luxury and we couldn't change the pattern on Edutopia's URLs because they had an investment in like social numbers and a whole bunch of other stuff, shares of these things that they wanted to retain. So we couldn't just change the URLs and the content and say, I know you were discussion slash foo, but now you're article slash foo. Sorry, couldn't do that. And we fought the good fight, we tried. It just didn't work out that that was a business uh, requirement that they could adjust. So we had to bail out on the idea that our friend was really gonna be able to own the knowledge of what that routing was going to do. And so instead, we're gonna quit trying hard and ask Drupal what it is. So we came up with the idea that instead of a stock JSON endpoint, 
we wrote ourselves a custom resolver. Basically, we pass the URL alias from the front end directly to Drupal without trying to guess what it is. And then Drupal looks it up, and we thought, is this going to be a performance problem? Turns out it was not. We just looked up the data, looked at the data, and said, oh, it's an article. Oh, it's a person profile, or it's a user, or whatever. And ran it, loaded up the JSON API stack, pumped that data into the JSON API stack, and rendered it as if it was a JSON API request. So we're getting JSON API data without the JSON API endpoint being responsible for answering for it. If this sort of makes sense. We just sort of solved the problem of that by doing an end run around it. This may or may not have been a wise choice. Um, so the outcome was the performance turned out to be fine. We, we only expended an extra couple of milliseconds uh, looking that up in Drupal as opposed to calling the JSON API endpoint directly. The system worked great. We could take a URL, come into Node, all the way back from Drupal, everything worked fine. We introduced finicky maintenance issues into the React front end when we did this because React wants to be handled a certain way. It wants to do things in a certain order. And when you take the routing logic out of React and hand off that responsibility to Drupal, you end up sort of moving some pieces around. So because we did it a little bit non-standard, uh, the business got what they wanted, but we ended up having to like handle errors in React in a way that was non-standard and clunky. So there, there were consequences to it. But as they say, any landing is a good landing sometimes. And sometimes you have to be pragmatic because your client needs what they need. So we did. So questions about sort of routing and just all that stuff. Yes? <clears throat> did you run into any kind of issue with this uh, issue with the special characters as part of URLs or anything like that in the routing? Not so much, but that's because we were coming from a legacy database which was already Drupal and was already Path Auto. So Path Auto was already stripping all that stuff out of there. So we, okay. we had a, a relatively clean, which is I guess a, a hidden blessing, a relatively clean haystack of URLs as opposed to a dirty haystack of URLs. Um, other other routing sorts of concerns that you've run into? Yeah. So could we have used like URL redirect? So that's an interesting question. We did have URL redirects that we had to do because there was a whole stack of redirects and the migration that, that had to come through. And so one of our things that we did with our, our routers was we we ended up with our, our custom resolver endpoint uh, firing, look, doing a lookup on, on the redirect table and saying, oh, there's a redirect. And we actually would fire 301 out of the router, uh, out, of, out of the Drupal side back to the front end, and the front end would, would do what it had to do with it. So we handled that because nobody could live with the idea that we have 10 years of, of redirects in Drupal that we're just going to throw away and not know about anymore or have to like sort of move those out to the web server level or, or figure out some other architecture for that. We were able to bake that into the API and it worked out. But that was a, um, again, sort of a, what do we do now? I guess we better do it. <laughs> you know, and so we, we baked our, our redirects into our, our resolver endpoint. Um, so editorial UX, this is the Edutopia homepage as of a few weeks ago. And there we go. Um, you can see my mouse moving. It's a recording, folks. You got a big hero. You got the the, the one and three layout. You've got um, a custom component here, which you know lets you sign up for the email if you want to. Got a couple of grids, like small image plus uh, blurb. You know, big video ones. Lists of content. You got all these components. This is the design system that that they had come up with that they hadn't been able to really implement in Drupal seven yet. And so we had all these different components that we knew we needed to be able to assemble. And so the way that we did it, if you're a fan of the Paragraphs module, anybody use Paragraphs? Yes? So at the time that we did this, Paragraphs had some cruft in it that we were not excited about using. And so we actually just were inspired by Paragraphs and we went and made our own version of that. So we built custom entities, which we called components, more's the pity. And um, you know, so this is an entity reference field of a bunch of different component entities. And so what we did, did I lose my? Yeah. yeah. I think my battery's dead. It's got a red light. Are there batteries? No? OK, we're going to forge ahead, y'all. Oh, it's going to get worse. OK. So without the microphone, what we ended up doing was, as you can see, we're editing right now. Uh, we've got some meta information, we've got a drop down that tells you how this component's going to render. And then you can reference 
via entity reference field any content within the system. So this is a, an editorially curated list of content. We also have, as you can sort of see there, um, criteria-based ones, which were not views. We found it easier and quicker not to hack views into our component situation, but just to build a component that fired off a query. And so we could specify certain taxonomy terms, be, be the, the query criteria, et cetera. So we had custom entities that we used to populate these things. So everything you saw in that, that big scroll down the home page was a, a custom entity that had a list of content, either moderated or by, um, by query, or it was a, a custom component that we knew we needed to be able to drop in there, like a newsletter. Yeah? What does queries do? No, uh, no. It was a set of drop-down boxes, oh, okay. selectors that, that we would use to say these taxonomy terms are. No, we do not put code into <laughs> fields. <laughs> Anybody who puts code into fields, you know, needs a gentle correction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, anybody who works for me and puts codes in fields needs something less than a gentle correction. Um, but uh, the basic idea being that those are you could select the criteria you wanted and some sorts and some other parameters, which was like views light, not views at all, but inspired by that, just faster and easier to build it this way. Then it would generate a query that would then you know, feed data into that. Um, the basic idea being, you could reference these components and then the API would have fields full of, of references to these components and it would also have references to the content those components reference, right? So all of that stuff that we did um, was great. The problem is this isn't always user friendly. Like that's a, a lot of fields and interface to juggle. And it's fine if you have an expert user who knows what they're looking at. It's not very visual the way that we built it, um, but we had other priorities we were trying to chase. And so since the people that were going to manage the homepage knew what it was going to look like, they understood the design system, they'd been a part of creating it. Um, these pages have clear design constraints, this component or that component. Like it's all going to look a certain way. And so because of that, because the users were experts, we said, let's go with it. Let's let them do it. And so we, made, we built this component situation. It worked great. They could build home page or, or other kinds of landing pages in a variety of ways. Uh, and that was great. For users who are not going to walk in and say, I want a three up layout. I want a grid of stuff. I want a list. If they're trying to write an article and, and drop um, photos or video or just whatever into it, you need a different solution. This is the where's my WYSIWYG problem, right? Everybody who loves Microsoft Word and its influence on editors, raise, okay, no, okay. <laughs> so the basic idea is we went through and enabled them to use the body field for this. And some of you are like, oh, I know how they did this. But we have a limited set of WYSIWYG buttons, not very many. We're not allowing a lot of markup in the WYSIWYG. There's our newsletter sign up thing again. Now it's not a component, it's a custom CK editor thing. We've got a, a related content widget that we've put in here. It's basically an entity reference field, but it's going to drop stuff into the body. And let's see, we've also got that E button up there, the end of the embed button, which some of you may be familiar with, but the idea is you, know, you can drop videos or, or images of that kind of stuff into the body. Um, so here I'm dropping in a, a, a video of one of my favorite bands. Here we go. We also had to do some hacking on this in order to make sure that the, the entity fields, like captions and credit and those kinds of things, were visible within the entity browser because that was not out of the box. So we had to do a little customization here and there. But the basic idea being, you could put stuff into the body. But Darren, unstructured content is bad, right? So if you're not in on the trick already, we did a trick. <laughs> um, so the media module, we set up to have entities for files and images and, and documents. Um, so if you uploaded something into the, into the, the system, it would have a, a Drupal content wrapper around this resource. Then on top of that, we used the entity embed or inline entity form, depending upon which piece of the CMS we were using, which let us take those Drupal content entities and drop them into the body. But the thing is, when you drop it into the body, it's still just in the body. And so I'm, I'm violating my, my unstructured content rule very badly at this point. But we also put an entity reference field that we hid. And anytime somebody pushed the, the embedded entity button into the, the WYSIWYG and hit save, 
it would look at the body and say, oh, I see Drupal entities in here. And it grabbed that Drupal entity and dropped it into the hidden entity reference field so that the entity would be available in JSON API. Yes? Because if it's not in the field, it's not in JSON API. Yes? You might be getting to this, but then how do you know where in the flow of that entity? I definitely am getting to this. <laughs> because, as sounds you will like, see. It sounds like magic stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And then we did some stuff to the media browser modals like you just saw for the caption fields. We had to customize CK Editor for some other stuff. There were things that we had to do in order to make all this go. But this is what you ended up with. In the JSON API response, you would have a Drupal entity. The Drupal entity would have a UUID. It is a long string of text, right? When you put this into the body, it's still no good to the React front end. But it is structured data. Because we have it that, that hidden entity field, which is sitting over on the side in the API response. So that UUID, it's hiding right there. That UUID is a key that references this other field, right? So having that, it is structured. So you take the big blob of body data, and we wrote on the React side, on the, on the Redux side, on the JavaScript side, we wrote a processor that you know we stuffed the body into and turned the crank and out came the body but broken up into pieces text blocks images text blocks videos newsletter da 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 right so then you can take that array of things and say what kind of component is this it's an image component run it through the react image component it's a video run it through the react video component and it does it in the proper order because you took it you found it in the body and you made an array of things so this was great. Editors could place a, a, a photo in the body field. They could, uh, this is you know the, the stuff that would have come from a React component. It pipes into the React component and renders it using that JSON API stuff. All good. The only people that were sad were our front end developers because they had to write that processor <laughs> that took apart the body into pieces and it's a little fragile. But a little fragile and a little maintenance when the, when the front end developers are sad and getting paid for being sad is okay. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the editors could use a WYSIWYG editor to do stuff and we didn't totally give away the, the structured data uh, that we needed to make the API work. So, does that make sense? Anybody just feel dirty looking at it? What, what, is, what, is, a lot of work. what are the chances that you've got the functionality for that somewhere that another front end developer could look at so that we don't have to? The chances are small at this point because we haven't figured out how to contribute it. It's all very like specific to the design system, specific to the, the React front end, and I don't know how portable it would be. Yeah, because I um, just got those little spinners right now going of what the hell did they do? Right. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of text processing. It's it's here's the body. Look for this particular yeah, string. Yeah, what are you splitting on, and where are you yeah, exactly. and yeah. uh, Basically, the, all the Drupal entity embeds say Drupal dash embed, and so we look for an angle bracket, Drupal dash embed, close angle bracket, and pull that out, and then you've got three pieces. You got whatever came before it. You've got the Drupal embed. And you've got the the thing that came after it. So with that, then you can take that little piece of markup, find the UUID in it, which is not very tough because it's in a, a data uh, attribute inside a piece of markup. So you have methods to do that. And then you go and you look in the JSON API and say, this is the data that goes into it. Therefore, this is the, uh, the data that's going to pipe into the component, and off you go. So it's not the worst thing in the world. It's just almost the worst thing. What's your fallback if something goes awry? What do, what, what, do, what do you guys have for your fallback if something ever goes awry in um, parsing? I'm just curious. We support contract. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're not lying. That, that is that's part of it. But also, the um, the way that you control this is you don't let put people, you don't let people put anything into the body that you're not ready to handle. So the WYSIWYG buttons don't allow for anything um, except what we want. The the filters on the on the CK editor strip out markup that it doesn't allow. So that we only have a certain whitelist of, of allowed things. Drupal entity is one of them, uh, or custom things like that newsletter component, which is not a Drupal entity. We just put in a marker that says this is the newsletter component. It goes here. Um, those are all allowable in CK Editor, and everything else is blacklisted. And so it gets stripped out before it ever makes it into the API. So there are certain controls that we do for that. Um, they did also want O embeds and Twitter and stuff like that. And if you try to drop an O embed with the O embed module, uh, you, you may have seen that button in the, in the CK Editor. 
uh, Twitter's going to work, but we don't really have the design system built out like on the design side for what Facebook or other things are going to look like. So that's not going to look good. So don't try and use the O embed button if you're not sure. That's really the only exception that I'm aware of where somebody could really break something. But then you've got unpublished content and drafts and, and reviews before that ever gets published. So you also have a human process on the editorial side. Yes? Um, just from like a project management side of things, do you really feel like that uh, trade off of like giving them what they wanted for a, a WYSIWYG was worth the effort that went into doing that? Um, or do you think it would have been worth it to fight more? Like, no, uh, just do it in the editorial experience that we want to build for you. That's, I mean, I've been totally messed up before. It's like, yeah, they, they, they want it. As a project manager, they want it the way they want it, and they want us to build it that way is, is powerful. Yeah. However, I've built the, the paragraph style, okay, now I want to add an image, now I want to add some more text, now I want to add another image, running down the page in the, in the node forms like that, and editors kind of hate it. Yeah. So I'm of the opinion that if we can get to the place where entity embed is workable on the front end, and it's not quite like so much pioneering work, but it's actually like this is, we have a way to do this. Maybe somebody needs to write a React library that makes this portable, which we haven't really gotten to yet. Then why wouldn't we let editors do it the easy way, you know, and control it the way that it needs to be controlled? Um, so, what time are we supposed to be in? I forget. 7.45. What? 11.45. So I actually have another 20 minutes. Yes. yes. That's amazing. Wonderful. Okay. So performance-wise, the things that make Edutopia fast are um, we spend a lot of time working to get code splitting working. Code splitting is where, like on a, on a typical, you know, two years ago, Drupal site, all the JavaScript is aggregated into one big file. Yeah? Everybody sort of seen that? And they do that because the HTTP request to get multiple JavaScript files is actually really time expensive. And so it slows the thing down to get lots of resources one at a time. HTTP2 makes that better, but we're not quite there yet. So what we ended up doing was code splitting where we, we said, okay, we know that we have all this JavaScript that's supposed to go into our app, and there are libraries that help you with this, but they have to be made to play with other libraries, and this is where the, the tricky bit was. We had server-side rendering going on so that, you know, like, you could request any page and it would actually render to the server and then it would give you that. So server-side rendering is a whole thing that I'm not talking about this morning. But code splitting and server-side rendering wouldn't talk to each other for the longest time. And those two libraries wouldn't play to get well together and we had to really work that out. But basically the idea is only the JavaScript that you need for the current page is what gets delivered to you. So if you're calling the home page, you don't necessarily get the article JavaScript. If you're looking at a person profile like an author, you're not getting article or, or home page JavaScript. So those things don't exist in the browser, haven't been asked for in the browser until they're needed. And that means that the, the total payload is much smaller. So we were able to reduce our total bundle size maybe like 40%, which is a big deal in terms of K over the wire and, and time to process it in the browser. So code splitting was a big effort that took kind of a long time that we would work on for a while and go away from it and come back to and work on some more when we had you know, quiet spots where QA was happening or the holidays or whatever. Um, so that was a big deal. Lazy loading of images and related content came really late into the build, but it was a huge boost because that long home page is full of articles and references to articles and images and all that stuff. Uh, also, at the bottom of, a, of an Edutopia article, I'm going to switch to here, right? If I can get my mouse back. There we are. So this is Edutopia, right? And if I get down to the bottom, there's that about to happen, right? So all these related articles come in. And what we're doing here is not only are we showing the, the related articles, but we're actually preloading some of that content in as it loads in so that when you click it, like fast, right? Like a button. Right. So you're, the, the reason it's fast is we already had that, that article in the, the Redux data store in memory in the browser ready to be rendered if, in case somebody clicked on it. So this whole lazy loading paradigm of get me the thing I need only when I need it is true for images and stuff on the page, but at the same time we're sort of looking around the corner and saying what might a user click on, like when you get to the home page, for example. You can bet that the home page, those first five items are all going to be waiting for you to click on because of the first things that are there and people are going to click on them. So when you click on them, up they come, bam. So 
it's a combination of lazy loading and preloading of the right stuff. We, we definitely did it wrong uh, early on where we preloaded everything because why wouldn't we want to preload everything? Because we thought it's really expensive to go to the videos page or the topics page. So we should preload all that stuff. And then it turns out that it was really <laughs> painful to, to preload all that. Too much stuff in the browser. Combined with sparse field sets. So JSON API at at the outset, JSON API gives you a um, <laughs> uh, a whole bunch of stuff for free. You say, "Give me that thing," and also give me um, any related entities. So the way that the JSON API result comes in then is, here's your normal content under data dot attributes, and then down at the bottom, there's included all the things you asked for on the API call to be included are there in their full data, like entire articles, entire <coughs> taxonomy terms, and everything related to them. So that whole related entity is really lots of stuff, and it's a lot to push over the wire, especially when you've got a home page with 15 or 30 articles. That's 15 or 30 articles worth of stuff that you're pushing over the wire. So then JSON API lets you, if you want, specify which fields within the data payload you actually want for every like thing, like an article or a person profile or whatever. So it looks a little bit like this. Fields and bundle type here is like node article. So you know, you've got your JSON API node, we're looking at landing page nodes. Um, we're filtering by the URL slug video, so we're going to the videos page. And then include related content. That is our field that has all the additional stuff in it. Then it says, I only want these fields, this list of fields from articles. I don't want any other article related data. And so what happens is the full article node goes down to a manageable size. All you're asking for is the basic meta information, the image that you need to render, those kinds of things. So late in the game, once we had built everything and it was stable, we said, okay, it's time to do uh, sparse field sets. So in, in hindsight, when your content model is not changing anymore, when you've got all your Drupal nodes firmly established and there's no like changes going on, and when your React components are <coughs> built out enough, or at least the designs are built out enough that you know which fields are going to be used from the content model in this implementation of a design, then you can come up with this list and say, I need this image, I need that piece of text, I need all those things. And then you get something like 60 to 90% reduction mm -hmm. in in the size of the data API as it comes through over the wire. Yeah. I might just miss this, but is that something that JSON API can do by default or something custom? It's part of the spec. Okay. All you have to do is know it's there. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah so I missed that one important part of knowing it's there. It's it's huge. We did, I didn't know it was there either. But my backend developer, Matt, was like, you know, there's this thing in the spec and Mateo says it's in there, so we should probably try and use this. And I'm like, yeah, we should totally use that. Yeah. Um, it seems like another way that that could be achieved is through views and the views rest yes. serialization, mm -hmm. where you define the fields that you want to pass back to yeah. the front end that way. So in this case, if you go back a slide to that URL that's being constructed, mm -hmm. um, you're sending that from the front end. Yeah. Um, it seems like that is maybe a little bit more um, messy or unpredictable if you know if this URL is being sent to the back end as opposed to the back right. end already being. And, and there are contexts in which our, um, our front end doesn't know what it wants for various reasons of the application at the time that the request is being made. So we actually have this hiding in the back end as well. We know what list we're going to be sending forward. So um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of that kind of stuff that we could do. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that as this stuff matures, I think that uh, rather than managing this just in like bare strings and making that a maintenance hassle because it is a maintenance hassle. Um, that we really ought to have structured ways to, to put this into the, into the React app so that you can easily manage it and then, you know, uh, when you go to construct this API call, you actually have ways to, to assemble this as opposed to type it in or, or whatever. Um, but there's nothing in React or, or Redux at this moment that that talks to JSON API, at least in, a, in our application, that, that would make it easier. I, I suppose there are JSON API libraries that we could have pulled in and used. Um, but at the time, it didn't seem like the extra bundle weight was going to be worth it for the performance that we were trying to hit. So uh, there may be better tools out there that I'm just not thinking of. So um, 
but we were able to, like on the homepage, you know, 90% of the data that we needed, 90% of the data we didn't need, we just cut right out and suddenly the homepage is faster. And also the browser doesn't have to have just like this lumbering huge amount of data and redex to, to, to sift through in order to find what it needs to update. So that's big stuff. Um, so two websites is definitely twice the work. Everybody can agree. Probably more than twice the work. Probably more than twice the expense. But if you know that you're going to have to reinvent the wheel sometimes and you're willing to do it, and you know that everything is harder because now there's two of them. I have twin daughters. <laughs> I'm a living example of knowing how much more work two is than one. Um, but multi-channel publishing and possibly the fastest side on the block might be worth it to you for the project that you're on. And one of these days, everybody's going to have to be that fast. So you know, this is one of the things with the security uh, privacy updates from Europe that have been coming through. The, the GDPR is requiring people to not broadcast you know, personalized information and stuff like that to ad networks. And I forget the site that I was looking at, but I saw a headline that said, you know, they had to cut all their ad code out and their site went from like 15 second load to like four second load just because they cut all the like social sharing and, and, and ad stuff out of it. This is what we're saying to clients all the time is your site sucks because it's too slow because you have ad code or sharing code or all that kind of stuff on it. And so one of these days, um, best practices and business practices and privacy practices are all going to align and everything's going to be fast on the internet, but not yet. In, the, in any case, while we're getting there, um, you know, decoupled is a way to, especially with this preloading stuff, to make it fast. Yes. So, what would the benefit? What was the benefit of using Drupal in this environment? I mean, could you use Contentful or something? You could, and, and there are, there are other CMSs that do this stuff. I think Drupal's content modeling, basically, uh, entities with fields and the ability to reference each other and all that kind of stuff is as mature as anything I've seen. Um, there are there are other things out there that do that kind of stuff. Even WordPress is, is doing some kind of like content type fielding kinds of stuff. Um, but I think the mixture of what we've got for content modeling tools and Drupal have had for a while, plus the uh, the API stuff like JSON API or, or even now GraphQL, which wasn't really available at the time that we, we built this one, is a really potent combination. So if you have the need for permissions out of the box, if you have the need for you know, building content models and, and so everything Drupal, else with Drupal So Drupal offers. Didn't, didn't add to the, make it, make it harder. Drupal really made it easier. Yes. But yeah, by all means. I mean, if you, if you don't need everything Drupal offers you, other than like JSON API, why would you use Drupal, right? It's an expensive proposition to put a Drupal site together. But if you, if you could benefit from all the stuff you get out of the box of Drupal plus JSON API on top of it, then in this case you were coming from a Drupal site. We were coming from a Drupal site. Also, Drupal's migration tools from anything into Drupal, especially with the, the way that they changed the API migration API for Drupal eight, is like like it's a joy to use. You know, so uh, yes. How are you dealing with um, like um, editor previews? Well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> How long did y'all practice that one? <laughs> we didn't. But. So, preview is another thing you can't do, right? Because when you press save in Drupal, you don't get the React front end, you get the Drupal front end. And it's either ugly or you have to actually spend money to make it pretty when no one's going to look at it but the editors. And it's valuable to make it look somewhat pretty, but what are you going to do? So, content moderation is now in Drupal core. This is what used to be workbench moderation, right? And so uh, we were using this in Edutopia so that the editors could write content, leave it as a draft, get it looked at, approve it, and then publish it. The problem is these two very fine modules do not talk to each other. JSON API at this point does not know about revisions in Drupal. So it doesn't know about drafts that are unpublished, basically. On the, on the flip side, content moderation does not and should not know anything about the way the content's going to be delivered. So there's no reason that these two should talk to each other. But it was a, a stumbling block for us. So we made an endpoint, which much like our resolver endpoint, um, was not a stock JSON API endpoint, but it loaded up the JSON API libraries and ran data through them so that we could get JSON API output. We built a, an endpoint that loads up revisions and runs them through JSON API, which means now we can get a JSON API of any draft that's unpublished, subject to the permissions which are on it, which thankfully JSON API respects. So 
Yes. Is that something you guys are going to contribute? That is definitely a thing we've talked about contributing. Yes. It's not a it's not a thing that's that's actually out the door yet, but it is a it is a huge um, win to be able to to JSON API revision and you know, protect it behind permissions and all that stuff. That's actually going to be my next question. Is yeah. Revisions. <laughs> so since it respects permissions, we could say nobody but the preview role can access a, a draft or editors and stuff, and then we hack the revisions tab and the node views in order to render links to a preview of a particular revision, which looks a little bit like this. Um, so we have the production URL, and we've got a configure variable that says, here's the host name that production's running on. We've also got a configure variable that says, this is where our previews run on, because it's going to be a different host name. Um, you click on preview of the latest unpublished draft, and it's going to take you out to a different host, which is the React stack, but set up to be able to, to pull a revision and look at it. Um, the revisions tab, if I had a screenshot here, it would show you uh, a list of every revision of this content and a preview link for each of them. So you can go back and look at previous revisions of all that. Um, on the front end, what do we have to do in order to make it work? Is a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, we needed a separate web host for previews because we don't want previews leaking into the world for, for the public to look at. So authentication becomes a question. We have to put it behind at least HTTP basic, if not something else more stringent. Um, we have the same React code base, with JavaScript and everything up front, but it has a config variable that says previews are on, and we know that this host name is the host name the previews are going to run, so Drupal knows that host name. We also know that um, previews are allowed here. Otherwise, um, previews would not be allowed. So on the front end, when previews are, are set to off, if you try to access a revision URL, it just fails you right away. It doesn't even send you back to, uh, to Drupal and try to get data and bring it back. So then when you click on a preview URL from Drupal, it goes out to the front end. The routing that we have in, in, the, in the React app looks at it and says, oh, it's a preview. It's got a, it's got a revision ID on it and a bunch of other stuff. It does a cross-checking to say, is this title actually attached to this revision? Because it could be that you could ask for a URL alias that was not tied to that revision and then you'd have a bug, right? So we made sure to not let that happen. Um, but then it goes to the preview endpoint, which is serving up drafts and, and revisions of content. It serves up that via the API instead. Um, we also have authentication because if it's permission blocked, then you need to be able to say via some Drupal auth scheme, I'm a legitimate user who can look at previews. So the front end has to have a handshake back and forth that allows that. Um, and then, as I said, previews can't be rendered on production. They can only be rendered where previews are allowed on this protected host name. So all that is to say, I guess that's the end of it. Um, you, could, you could pop that, look at it, see it. And then there's a question about, OK, now, now I'm looking at a preview. Can I browse to see other previews in other states? That's not really what we did. We basically just built a machine that shows you a previous state or a future state of one piece of content, not of the entire site at a, at a moment in time, which is a whole different problem. Um, but it was effective for what we were trying to do in terms of users being able to preview content. So when you when you hit the link, up it comes. You can see the changes that were made. You can see it rendered into into the front end as you know actual users will see it, and it made it really easy to pass URLs around uh, the editorial staff and say this thing is ready for a look. Tell us if it's good or not. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's that was our preview solution. It was the lightest weight preview solution we could come up with. It didn't involve like you know tons of machinery and a backhoe. So, um, questions about anything? We got about five minutes. Posting the slides, please, on your session. Yes, link. Thank sure. You. Right now, they're PowerPoints. I'll have a PDF or something out that'll do it. Because I use Windows. <laughs> anything else? Uh, what did you use for implementing Insight Search? Uh, we used Algolia, which is a service which is super fast and depending upon your use case, not overly expensive. Um, if you do a lot of things with it, it might become burdensome. But um, Mateo, again, uh, I guess we'll name him our hero for this particular session. Mateo said, oh, yeah, NBC's using Algolia for some of their stuff. And so we threw it our way. And it's a, a very easy API to set up. And, and, and the trick of it was we had to do some stuff with our content to expose it to Algolia. So there was a little bit of, of work on our side on the Drupal side for the indexing of it. Um, other than that, though, it was pretty solid. So, You mentioned the idea of it you know, potentially being twice as much work to take this approach. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in hindsight, would you say it was twice as much work or more than twice as much work? Because it feels like maybe more. I would say any time you do two stacks that have to talk to each other, you're not building two things. You're really building two things and then debugging both of them with each other. Yeah. And then you got to figure out the infrastructure and the like, the logging and incident response. And it's more than two websites worth of work. It just happens to be a bunch of work around two stacks. Yeah. Uh, have maybe an idea of what this cost decline? Um, In the millions? Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. At least. I mean, I would say that, I mean, we worked, a team of three worked on it for close to a year. So that was not cheap. Yeah. And, and you guys are still Sorry. working with them. So. We are still working with them. John is still attached to the project as well. So I'm just going to ask follow up after this has been launched and running for some time. If it's twice the work to get it done, how's the payoff been since it's launched for the client? Uh, it's been interesting because just as we launched, Facebook changed their API. Uh, in a way that was detrimental to, to their business model. They couldn't get shares back, like share data back from Facebook. So like shares and comments um, used to be, if you made it on the website in a Facebook widget and it went out to Facebook, that would all sync up. And like the number of shares and the comment counts and stuff, that does not happen anymore from Facebook because it closed their API down in a very specific way. So to my knowledge, Eric and the folks at, at uh, Glef, Agitopia, are um, working really hard to figure out a way to, to fix that uh, and fix their business model so that they're not so dependent on Facebook to pass them information that Facebook isn't willing to pass. Um, so that is a, um, that's a real problem for them. So it's been, it's been hard, therefore, to say, wow, this was a rising success. Everything we can look at from performance numbers, huge success. Um, I think traffic is good as well, but the uh, they're working really hard on um, AMP, so Google AMP and and all the the modifications to to markup and and stuff that they have to do within the site is going to launch within the next month or two, um, and then the site's really going to be blazing. But on top of that, they're going to have a better you know presentation on the on the Google stuff to get more traffic into their site, which I think is important for them. You, you mentioned that the. the Earlier, you said that making this, using this stack needed to be done in a way so that you weren't really changing the wheel for their team. Mm -hmm. Are they all? Are they seeing an ease, uh, a greater ease of maintenance and upkeep with this over time, or is it um, for their editorial users? Yeah, um, uh, the tools are better because there was a lot of cruft in their old content model that they just needed to get rid of after ten years of of adding implementations and abandoning them over time because they weren't doing that business initiative anymore. So everything is cleaner in terms of the, like they have one article, not three content types that all do articles. And so that's better. Um, managing of the home pages are better. Lots of stuff is better. Um, they also switched, they built a, a Drupal 8 asset manager, which is holding all their images, which we integrated with as well. So our media entities reach out and grab stuff from there and bring it in so they now have a more unified sort of image storage and made information and a bunch of stuff like that, which was all them that they were doing before we got there. Um, we just got to participate with it. But the, there's lots of improvements that happen at Glef for that. Um, and I think overall the, uh, the experience has been great. On the developer side, of course, they, they had to learn a bunch of stuff. And that is ongoing. I mean, that's the, one of the reasons why John, the front end guy, stayed and not uh, you know, for the longer term and not our, um, our back-end developers because, man, the, the, the bulk of the stuff they need to learn is over on the React side. So, um, but great team there. So they're picking it up. Anything else? Thanks. Thank you.